Hello friends. In this video we're going to take a look at this uh, stereo receiver system that I picked up. I got this at an estate sale for the amazing low price of absolutely free. Turned out I got there just as the place was closing and the guy was giving stuff away and even more or less made me carry off some stuff that I didn't kind of want but I thought I'd be nice and help him out. This is a JVC RX dash 509V digital surround system receiver. Judging by the features, it's probably about 20 years old. It's got CD and VCR buttons. Uh, might even be older than that because it doesn't have DVD, which might be something you'd have on this. Lots of buttons, lots of features. Surround system, big tuning knob, lots of channels on the back. We'll look at those later. But basically this looks like a pretty deluxe system in its day. I've checked on eBay and these go for about $60 to $70. And uh, I think one of the reasons they don't go for more is that it's very heavy. It's got a large transformer inside. Maybe we can see that real quickly. Let's take a peek through the top. So this is kind of a typical construction for this, an air grill on the top. Big transformer, multiple boards cabled together. And this has a remote control feature on it. Turns out the remote controls on eBay go for like $40. So sometimes with older equipment like this, the remote control is worth as much as the receiver itself. I didn't really need this, but it's kind of hard to turn it down for free. Um, it may be a better replacement for some others that I've got that are kind of in the same category. This has more features and more outputs. And in particular, the primary system that I use for my uh, general stereo listening, uh, the remote control's gone bad. I bought a substitute remote control on that. It can only do a few functions. So I may end up replacing that with this if it sounds good and then you know invest another forty dollars in a remote control and this being a more mainstream unit uh, than the other one that I've got which is an adcom it's kind of a specialized unit um, it sounds really good I like it but the remote control is kind of a problem this also has a surround feature if I want to use that which I never had that before and most of the features of this are pretty standard as far as power phones, dual sets of speakers, you know, bass and treble as opposed to a control, tone control, balance, lots of different uh, uh, options here. JVC is kind of a mid-range brand as far as audiophile type stuff goes. It's not normally audiophile grade but it's also not at the low end. It's kind of you know, good quality mid-range type stuff. So if you're not an audiophile but are just looking for something that sounds good, this might be a good choice for me. So in these videos I usually do teardowns. I may take the lid off of this for a closer look, but really my goal in this is to hook it up and see what happens. Check it out, see if it works. That's a pretty simple process. You may know how to do that. In which case, uh, maybe this isn't the video for you. But, um, there's a lot of these kind of, you know, multi-receiver system things available in thrift stores for not a lot of money, you know, the $10 to $50 range. Um, and usually they work, it's that they've been kind of made obsolete by something else, like one of the features that this is lacking that you'd expect in a newer system is some sort of Bluetooth connection and maybe... Uh, you know, a smartphone control or even a Wi-Fi connection where you can control it at a distance through your smartphone. Um, so this is sort of obsolete in the sense of not having the newest features, but it's still very much a viable stereo if it sounds good and it works. So we'll try that next. So as a very first test, I've just plain plugged it in. I see that this standby light came on. Turn on power. 
Got an FM display light here. The fact that this came from an estate sale makes me think that it worked. It was just, you know, something that the late owner didn't have a need for anymore. So next we'll try to hook up some basic things to it and uh, give it a listening test. So here's the back panel without anything plugged in. This is all pretty standard stuff. Lots of input connections and output connections. These are RCA phono connectors as they're called. Uh, speaker connectors. Switched and unswitched outlets to gang together some of your related equipment such as a CD player or whatever you have. I'm going to put on some antennas that I didn't get from the guy but that I have in stock. This is a little AM loop antenna. Really don't listen to AM but uh, you know we can test that while we're here. So here's a little FM uh, I believe this is a dipole antenna. Typical type stuff. Just put those on here and give that a try. So I've just gone ahead and put these into their uh, connectors. Polarity doesn't matter on these type of antennas. Two FM wires or two AM wires. This is the AM loop. So that's where we're at right now. We're going to hook up the speakers next. These are some speakers that I had sitting around. These are off of an old boombox of some kind. Uh, they're cheap, they're plastic. They probably don't sound all that great, but I'm just here for a functional test right now. One thing you may want to know about stereo speaker hookups is you want to have the polarity of the speakers matched. And sometimes the manufacturers help you with some sort of marking. So here we've got a kind of a dashed line here, a black for one speaker, and then this other speaker, the wire is gray, but it has a dash line here. So I'm kind of assuming that the polarities of the dash lines go together. Now it doesn't matter whether we put the dash in the red or the black here, but just that we want to have, I'm going to just pick one, we're going to put the dash in the red on here, and the other dash in the red on here, and that should get our feet speakers in phase. If they're not in phase, they sound rather terrible and you may be able to notice but in particular you, you do not get a good stereo image so um, it's important when you hook up speakers to this type of system to be sure you get the phase matched between the two speakers which amounts to making sure that the corresponding wires are on the corresponding red or black positions so here I've gone ahead and put the uh, speaker wires in. They're on set number one here at the top. There's another set number two down below. And uh, this is for a center speaker down here. We won't work on that for now. But if we can just basically get a stereo signal out from FM, that's kind of the next goal. Okay, we've got it turned around. I'm gonna Turn it on, turn the volume down all the way first on FM 87.5. Doesn't seem to be locking on that one. That may not be a valid channel here. See, we should have a scan button. I happen to know that 89.3 is our local public radio station. Okay, tuning stereo. So that means we're locking on. Let's turn it up and see what we hear. Nothing so far, but I've got the speaker 2 button in and speaker 1 button out, so I think that's the problem. Better turn that back down just in case. I'm Jared from Fresno, Texas. I drive 18 wheelers and Freudy on the side. Mm, a long line of cowboys. My daddy, grandpa, all of them just. Okay, I got lucky there because uh, since that was some sort of talk, it isn't going to be nabbed by Google as a copyright violation. They're pretty aggressive about that if it was some sort of song playing off the air. 
so we have already shown that this works on a real basic level let's go ahead and try the AM just for fun let's see where's the AM button right here okay we'll turn that up we're hearing the usual crackle of AM you know it you love it you can't live without it as David Letterman used to say I don't happen to know the Defend themselves with deadly force if necessary. Okay, so there's the usual talk radio. Don't mess with the IRS. For tax help you need. 71 or 710 has been around in the Kansas City area since I was a kid and probably before. So as I suspected, what we've seen here is that this uh, shows every sign of working. Haven't tried out every feature of it. Um, so... We'll stop there for now and then go on to other features. Now let's talk more about the input hookup of this. There's basically three categories of inputs here. Phono for the phonograph and what we'll call line inputs which is CD, tape 1, tape 2, VCR and video and I'm going to make a third category which is these tapes that have in and out so uh, these are intended for tape recorder devices uh, I've done some research on this and found out that it's vintage 1992 so a kind of a deluxe unit for 1992 would have two cassette tape and you know maybe you'd use a reel-to-reel -reel tape or if you were on the high-end VCR so from a signal point of view the phono is fundamentally different that's designed for the very weak signal that comes out of a phonograph or turntable the others are really interchangeable CD, tape 1, tape 2, VCR on the inside so the labels are really a convenience. You can use any what's called line level device, which is basically a CD, DVD player, a cassette tape recorder, VCR, you know, Blu-ray player, PlayStation, anything you can think of. Um, would almost all go on any of these on the input side. You wouldn't ever use the output side in a lot of situations if you didn't actually have uh, a tape deck of some kind on there. We've also got video here, which isn't of interest to me at this point. That's analog video, which is more or less obsolete except with some older devices. Now over here I've rewired a better set of speakers. We worked before with this set, which worked fine. I've got the set number two here and I'm using center speakers this supports surround speakers so that would be five channels I told you wrong when I said these were unswitched one of these is unswitched that's on my other unit turns out these are both switched so that's convenient basically you plug in one of your other devices and then you only have one power switch to deal with so next we're going to turn this around and try it out with this different set of speakers and a different set of output. Started to hook up some better speakers with this and uh, was going to go all the way through it to try out some more functions and I found a problem with the volume control. I'll show you that. So I've got some music going into the CD port from my phone. This is officially sanctioned by YouTube so they can't bust me for copyright infringement. You notice it's static key as I turn it up. Like right there. Doesn't change volume smoothly. We'll try the other side for comparison next. So here I'm using the other side, the left side. That moves smoothly with no static. 
Oh yeah. Getting some in the middle there. Anyway, it's better than the other side. So what we're going to do is uh, spray in tuner control cleaner and lubricant. This is a Radio Shack product. I've had this can for like 20 years. This stuff doesn't go bad. Uh, Radio Shack is no more. It's available online. You can get other kinds of electronic cleaner products. They have different chemical formulations. I can't tell you which one is good or bad or best, but this stuff works. And what we're going to do is spray that in directly to the pots. And this is made with some sort of a chemical that doesn't um, doesn't leave residue, isn't harmful to electronics. And it's kind of hard to see under these cables, but what we've got back here is a little motor that controls the volume through the remote control. And we have tuning pots. So kind of the preferred way to do this in an audiophile sense and probably made sense in other ways in 1992 was to have um, a motor controlling a pot as opposed to some sort of electronic audio control that's purely digital. Um, I suspect that's what they're using in a lot of newer units but it may be that the high-end audiophile units still use this because they dislike digital. So let's go ahead and spray that in to what appear to be some holes here. Get the unit turned off. Forgot to unplug it, but we'll do that now. Always better to work with something unplugged if you can. I'm gonna move this back and forth to kind of get the solution worked into the pot there. I don't really know for absolute certain that it went in. Uh, those look like holes on the top that are maybe intended for this purpose. I've seen other channels where they go into this pot cleaning thing in detail, um, talk about all the different fluids. Another approach that I've seen uh, Uncle Doug do, which is a wonderful channel, um, he tends to kind of take things apart and completely clean them which is maybe ideal but for my purpose I'm not committed enough to this unit that I want to go to all that trouble but if I can just squirt a little stuff in I'll just squirt one more time a little here I guess there's still something in this can let's find out yep something in the can and this stuff is electrically neutral and evaporates pretty quickly so that's why it's you know intended for this type of electronic use so just trying this even with the music off still got a spot here this is the left channel only we will go to a balanced in the center Not hearing any bad stuff on the right side at all. So let's get our music going and see what we get. Okay, this music seems to be mixed with a lot of the high frequency drums on our snares and things on this side. Let's try a different one. Maybe it has more of an even mix. So I think that's a vast improvement and may have a little bit more to go. We may do some more rotating and some more uh, squirting of the magic can but I'll put this back on the shelf and keep it for another 20 years 
Don't use very much of it or very often. But you can see how that turned this unit into something that we might throw away or salvage from that into something that's, uh, you know, usable because the time and effort and expense of fixing it was was pretty minimal. So since I can do this with the CD setting, uh, I'm going to try the other line settings that we talked about separately. I won't show you all of those, but I'll just tell you if one of them goes wrong. So I went ahead and checked out all the other basic functions of this, the line inputs. I've hooked up this old turntable that I had uh, got from my mom's estate. I don't know for certain that it works, but it probably does. Already switched the unit on to phono mode. As you might be able to see over there. We've got this all the way hooked up. We've got our two channels of RCA connectors here and also this ground wire. Now the ground wire isn't absolutely essential but for good practice and good sound you want to have that. Basically the action of the needle on the record creates static electricity that can affect the sound with static and popping and so this ground wire gives that a place to go so that the static electricity dissipates from the needle and the LP. So we're going to start this out and see what happens. Oops. Looks like this turntable has a motor problem. Okay. Well, here's another method. If your turntable has a motor problem, which I don't really recommend in general. We'll just put that on the record. Oops, that's skating around. That's not good. Anyway, if I fiddle with the needle. Okay. I have a better turntable to try this with, but... We're hearing stereo static when I poke the needle with my finger. So that proves that the unit is working. So that proves that the receiver is working even though the turntable isn't. So let's try again with a better turntable. Okay I've got a better turntable hooked up. This is my main turntable that I use. It's an Audio-Technica ATLP60. Got this on Amazon for like $110 or something like that. These are kind of widely known as a high quality, good value, budget turntable. So certainly not audiophile quality, but uh, if you just want to hear some basically good sound, this is uh, recommended and that's kind of the level I'm at. I've hooked this up the same as before, except I skipped the, uh, the static ground cable, just to make it simple. I've chosen a very obscure record for this. We'll see if YouTube goes after me for a copyright violation. We're going to play a few seconds, and if they do, I'll have to substitute something else. But they're pretty hardcore as far as copyright violations go because they don't want to take any chances. And so no matter how obscure or worthless a record is, you can still have problems with YouTube. So here we go. Start her up. This would look better without the co dusty cover. You have to turn on turntable mode, phone on mode. 
see, turn up the sound. Welcome to Z. Oh, 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 what a gal. We won't play too much of that because the more you play, the more likely they are to get after you. Now, in principle, I should be able to use this for educational purposes, such as we're seeing now, but YouTube doesn't look at it that way. Here's a fun little fact. You can actually hear it coming directly out of the needle. So we got what we wanted here, which is we proved that the turntable function of this works. Or the phono function, as they call it. And uh, as I said, that is kind of in a separate category from all the other line level inputs. Basically, a unit like this includes what's known as a phono preamp which boosts what comes out of a turntable into uh, a line level input internally that can go into uh, the rest of the unit. Um, you can also buy phono preamps that are kind of separate units. That's more for the high-end audiophile, but for uh, purposes of a mid-range person like me, you know, the built-in phono preamp here is just fine and I may not ever really even use that feature of this unit anyway now that we've got it working and checked out let's go for a tour of the insides here starting at the back cord we've got what I call a power conditioner module this has the two AC sockets on it. I think this is a low voltage power supply probably to run the uh, the processor and kind of control electronics. Here we've got the large transformer that's going to run all of our uh, audio power. Got some fuses. Probably a full wave bridge rectifier here with these four diodes. Those are kind of standing up in the air for a little uh, free cooling, some capacitors for the power supply. Going over here, this large heat sink has large transistors connected to it, and or these may be full power amplifier modules. Here's another smaller one that's connected to it. So if we work this out, it might be, you know, the we're going to have a total of five channels to deal with here. These two look similar. So maybe those are the front, left, and right. Here's the, maybe the rear, left, and right. This little one, I'm not sure what that is. Maybe has to do with the center. Here's our volume control section that we talked about earlier. This is just a little connection board that goes to the speaker wires back here. This is an RF board that works with the AM and FM antennas. So this is the RF section and ultimately probably audio comes out of that. Here we've got a lot of capacitors and miscellaneous. Uh, that's probably the main processor board. Got two large capacitors here which run the probably the main power supply filter capacitors. These two back here might be kind of uh, initial filter capacitors. Got what are probably little driver boards for these power transistors or maybe amplifier modules. Down in here who knows there's some audio gain somewhere in here. There's some power resistors and you'll notice that 
this entire unit is built with leaded components so that's consistent with 1992 today a lot of these components would be or maybe almost all of them would be uh, surface mount components that's kind of taken over the industry at some point uh, in the last 20 years I don't really know this type of leaded parts are really only used for large parts nowadays that have to be physically large like capacitors uh, you can also see a lot of strapping wires which is basically a, a way to allow a, a simpler PC board modern PC boards might have um, or probably surface mount ones would have layers inside them that do interconnection but this is basically it looks like a one-sided PC board where they've used these jumper components um, to do in effect act like a top layer you can see that there's no circuit traces on the top layer but these jumpers sort of act like the circuit traces and that kind of jumper makes sense in a machine that's populating a leaded board like we're seeing here but in a modern surface mount board you wouldn't want to have that because the leaded machine is probably different from the surface mount machine so that completes our tour of this uh, JVC digital surround system receiver hope you enjoyed it if so give us a like and a thumbs up and subscribe and tell your friends thanks for watching bye bye